There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of God's love for man. The Bible, when you read the Bible, you cannot read the Bible from the perspective to see what you must do for God. The only way in which we read the Bible is to see what God has done for us and how it affected us. Hallelujah. That, is a, that means there's no condemnation. Amen. And I want to tell you this, this, this message is spreading all over the world. And God backs this message. God is behind this message. One thing I know when I preach, and I've I've heard it so many times, you know, when I I preach in places where people are very legalistic or against the message, um, then God says to me, don't worry, I'm for it. (laughs) So, uh, um, I mean, if, if it's only me and God believing this, we're a majority. Isn't it? Because I'm sure, I mean, God believes it, then I'm sure all of heaven believes this. And all of the people that has died already has come to the knowledge of the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. Um, and all the angels. So why will you agree with maybe six billion others on earth that doesn't agree with you? We agree with heaven. I mean, we agree with what Christ has done for us. And that is to make us righteous, free from our works, and to justify us in our actions. You know, what, what I mean by that is to manifest what is done for us in our lives. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Let's just pray together. Father, I want to thank you that we can be here together. Holy Spirit, thank you that you speak through me in a powerful way today in order that many people can believe. Many people can come to the knowledge of the full salvation that there is in Jesus. So that true peace can saturate every person's heart and mind and that good works can flood our lives because of what you have done and not because of our own efforts. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to say to you, you know, that the vision that God has given you, the first thing is don't wait in laziness and think it's going to fall out of the sky. God will empower you to live the way you need to live, and He will open the door. So what you do is, if God said to you in business or in anything, listen, this is what I'm going to do for you. Be busy with what you know you can do today. And as you are busy with what you can do today, you will find the power of God giving you favor. Amen. God will give you favor on that which you are busy with today. And just to wait for it to fall out of the sky is not going to work because what fell out of the sky was Jesus. He did fall out of the sky. And then he, His Holy Spirit fell out of the sky to empower you to do something. So we are not doing so that God can fall out of the sky and bless us. He fell out of the air and came to earth and blessed us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can do. Hallelujah, man. God has empowered us. In the Old Testament, we did good works to be saved. In the New Testament, we have been saved and good works is one of the benefits that we've received for free. And we can function and live in that. I, I was on a, we, we did a trip to Zambia uh, recently. Now, the way you get into this place is deep in the bush. So you fly from Cape Town, so that's a four-hour flight, two hours to Johannesburg, two hours to Lusaka. Then from there you get on a bus. The bus is ten hours to, um, to Mongu. Then you sleep there the night. Then the next day you get on a little boat, those canoes with a little engine on the back. And then you, you for 10 hours on that to get to the, to the town where we go. <laughs> so that's really in the bush. It, it takes you days to get there using, including using an airplane. So we went out into that bush and we could see how this gospel of grace impacts the lives of people in the bush and prospers them and blesses them. 
because they could see the, 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 I could see the absolute fruit also coming into their lives. What's nice about the thing is when you're on the boat and you wait and the people say you must be there at 8 and then at 2 o'clock you haven't left yet. <laughs> You've received something for free from God. And you effortlessly make use of patience. <laughs> because that's what you've been empowered with from God. You know, when, we, when you go there, we don't go with a thing of, well, you know, we are these South Africans and everything must go quick and we will now bite our teeth because we are Christians to see this good work. You know, and be patient. A person that is patient is somebody that's very impatient faking his patience. <laughs> no, God has come to give us the real deal, the real thing, a gift for free from God. Amen. That you don't have to struggle to have patience when you see the way they work. Where you find the patience in your heart because you've believed upon the full salvation. We've be, we, we have been saved into the goodness of God and the very character of God. When you look into the mirror, the Bible says in, in, in James, the perfect law of liberty. 2 Corinthians 8.13, if you look into the law, into the, into the glory of God, which is also called the law of liberty, when you look into the glory of God, who do you see? You see yourself. Now the thing is, if you look at Jesus and who He is, can you really believe what you see? You see a person full of patience. You see a person full of long-suffering. You see a person full of love for all people all the time. And that is you. That is who you are. And if you can believe what you see, you'll be a doer of what you see. But what we've seen, I've seen in my own life, and in, in grace churches, is we've seen the one aspect, and that is that we are righteous before God. But I want to tell you, our salvation extends the place of we, we are simply righteous before God. It has come to the place where we find the very nature of God indwelling us. And why settle for half a salvation saying, well, I'm righteous before God, but you're so frustrated with what you do every day? That's a life of frustration. That's not victory. Victory is the nature of God indwelling you as a free gift. All you've got to do is, to, is believe that God has made you patient in Christ. And that patience will then not manifest by you trying to be patient, but the Spirit of God empowers you unto that patience or love or whatever it is. Amen. If I've got a problem that I molest children, and you come to me with the gospel and tells me God's not angry with me, that's awesome. But how weak would it be if you cannot be set free? The wonderful thing is, under the Old Testament, we had to be set free from our sins to be saved. Under the New, God's not angry with us. We've been delivered from the law, resulting into the very life of God. And that empowered by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? We were chatting, you know, one night, and we, we came back from the, from the outreach, and it was awesome. You know, you, the people were so excited. They couldn't stop to shout, you know. It's like at the end, after I preached, the people were standing up. They were shouting this freedom, and you couldn't get them quiet. They just keep on shouting. You know, so it was just this awesome presence. We came back, and what we said is, what the, what's so wonderful is, it wasn't we that went now to have this outreach, and we preached, and look what we've done. What happened is there's no law that tells me I must go and preach. There's no law that says I must go and heal the sick, otherwise God's angry with me. I'm under no law, and nobody has manipulated me to do it. But what I found was I found myself doing it. So who was doing it? I could literally witness God Himself live in my body. Isn't that freedom? <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And when I see, when I, when I see the, the, the team of people we, we, that, that was laying hands on everybody, I was seeing God living in people. Because we're in the New Testament. We're not under an obligation to do anything for God. 
But the good that we saw was God living. I could stand in awe and say, wow, that's how it looks when God manifests in human flesh. We've been saved into that. We don't work ourselves into that. That's part of our salvation package. And let's not only take, well, God's not angry with me. Let's say, God is not angry with me and gave me His life. Amen. Listen, in, if, if, you, if you are God, if you were God, and you know that your children is going to live in a world, let's talk about finances, where money will be unstable. Finances is unstable. You say, but, but it, no, finances is not unstable. You know, let me tell you, God said, don't trust in uncertain riches. So if God said it's uncertain, I want to tell you, there will be people for as long as what this earth remains in a fallen state that will make money out of the uncertainty of riches and it's called the stock market. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you know that your children is going to live in a place where there's uncertainty of riches, what will you give them? Remember, you cannot say the only gift I'm going to give them is money because it will be gone tomorrow maybe. What about the Christian farmers that lived in Zimbabwe? You know, what, what about that? So now, I'm not saying God will not meet your need. I'll, I'll talk about God meeting our needs. I'm just talking about the instability of finances. What will you give your kid? God has given us contentment. Hallelujah. Because that keeps your emotions stable. It keeps you in a mindset of victory, even if you don't have or if you have. And that's the thing that God has given us. And we cannot swerve away from that truth, for that is the powerful gifts is given unto the church. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I don't care what this world throws at me because the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into different trials and temptations for it will work patience. So what it's actually saying in normal English is, doesn't matter what comes your way, God has spiritually enabled you that that thing cannot touch you. And all of that manifests out of a belief of what we have truly been saved into. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to talk a little bit about spiritual warfare. I remember there was a time when I believed spiritual warfare was binding the devil walking around the town. And one day we, we, we did the spiritual warfare around a small town. You know, it's a small town until you must walk around it. <laughs> so we're going to walk around this town seven times binding the devil. And then I realized that that was not spiritual warfare. It was exercise. Now, I'm not into that type of spiritual warfare anymore. So you can put your shoes on. Amen. We're not walking nowhere. We're sitting. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that He may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, now let's just first stop there. So it says, be strong in the Lord. I want to read something else. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now let me read it to you in a way that you can understand what Paul was writing there. It says, don't be strong in Moses and in its effects. So many times we find people are strong in Moses, and this is a grace church, but we find people strong in Moses and in the five steps to blessing and the, 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 the motivational behavior modification type of a teaching. And we are strong in that and in the effect of that. Now, a behavior modification teaching will have an effect on people. It does. If we think that behavior modification teaching does not change people, we are fools. 
It does change people. And it does give them better lives. I've seen it. I've seen people apply certain steps of behavior modification and it, it, it changes their marriage. But the Bible talks about that as being born and finding its origin out of the will of man. So in other words, you will have a better life, but it's born out of your willpower. And John chapter 1 verse 12 says that those who've accepted Christ, they have got, they are the offspring of God. They are those who are not born of the will of man or the will of the flesh or of blood. So there's different new births. You get somebody, he's been an alcoholic all his life. Then he goes to AA. And maybe he doesn't even hear about the name of Jesus. But through a certain system of certain points and certain things they follow, a new man is born that doesn't drink anymore, that loves his wife. So he has been born again he was born from his mother. He, be, he was a very bad sinner. Without accepting Jesus, his life was changed, and he's a new man. But that new man's origin is not God. The origin is the will of man. So there are many people today that are born again. But the origin is not the revelation of the cross. The new life they live comes out of their own power. They are not strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, which I will explain what it is now. They are strong in a new mindset. In other words, change, just think positive. Just think positive. Now, it is a wonderful principle that comes out of the Bible that's been just being used without thinking of the real positive thing, which is the resurrected Christ, which is the image of you. That's why uh, 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 Jesus went to the Pharisees and He said to the Pharisees, now listen to what He says. We must know all of man, everybody that sits here, we are children of God. Because we've been created by God. The Bible says, in the, the, even the Greek philosophers in Acts 17 and Paul quotes them, says, as your philosophers said, that we are the offspring of God. So all people are made by God. And in that sense, children of God, for they've been created by God. But then he says to somebody created by God, he said to the Pharisee, your father is the devil. So how can that be? Because Satan cannot make human beings. So what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about the holy life the Pharisee lived. For he said, who you are and what you do finds its origin in Satan. Now this was said to a very holy man that tithed on everything he got. If somebody would give him a bottle of pepper and say, listen, I bless you with the salt and this pepper, they would take 10% of that and tithe. Now, I don't know who here can do that. They did that. They lived a very holy life. They were, they were reading the Bible, don't know how many hours a day. They devoted themselves to the, the, wearing only the right clothes. Absolute holy. Jesus said, everything in you that you see, all this holiness, is born out of Satan. Now, where does that come from? How? Because it is man's effort, the doctrine of Satan, that originated when he was still in heaven. And he was kicked out because of that doctrine. And that was a doctrine that said, by my own power, I will place myself on the mountain of God. Now, just for just something very interesting. Satan was in heaven. When he was in heaven, the Bible says he was on the mountain of God and he was amongst the stars of God. Created by God like that, more beautiful than any of the other creatures. Then he said, I want to place myself on the mountain of God, amongst the stars. But he was on the mountain of God, amongst the stars. 
But what he was saying is, I don't want to be here because God puts me here. I want to be here from a different foundation, which is my own ability. And God said, there's no place in heaven for man's own ability. And he kicked him out. That's the greatest sin there is. There's no greater sin than that. Man's own ability, man's own effort to be where he thinks God wants him to be. Or man's own effort to be where he thinks God's created him to be. Satan knew God created him to be on that mountain, but he wanted to be there. It's like business. You work for the boss, he pays you a very good salary, but then you say, listen, I want to be a subcontractor. I want to do the same job, but I want to do it on my own effort. It's like somebody coming to you, you cannot afford a car. And he buys you a car, and he gives you a car. And you say, listen, thank you for this nice car. But I want you to take the car back, I want to buy my own car just like this. The end result is exactly the same. The vision, the place you go is exactly the same, but the source of power is different. And that is what the Bible, what the Bible says, and we're talking about spiritual warfare now. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So we are strong in the fact that God became a human being. What does it mean if God became a human being? It means that God came and indwelled human flesh, making humans godly. We are strong in that, and then in the power of His might, which is the resurrection power. The power of His might is, stands opposite to the power of our own might. We are strong in the Lord, we're not strong in our own ability. We are strong in what He's done for us. Adam and Eve sinned. When they sinned, what did they do? They started to believe what Satan believed that caused him to be kicked out. Because there's no place in the kingdom of God for that mentality. So they believed and said, we will be like God by knowing right and wrong. But they were like God by the Holy Spirit. So they never tried to sin. Their vision was not, listen man, we want to sin and hate God and all those type of things. Their vision, their goal was holiness. It was holiness. It was like, to, if you must put it in today's terms, it's not like um, you, you want to go and sin and fall in adultery and steal people's things and become a groot skellum. No, no. It, you, the temptation was to be like God, but the, with a different form of power, which is man's own ability to do what's right. So that is the biggest sin there is that caused the fall and everything. Now it says, let's be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let's read chapter 1 uh, of Ephesians um, and verse 17. It says, Paul prays, he says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. Now just, uh, this is for free. The spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge is different to knowledge and wisdom. I've seen people, you come to them and, 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 and you, you say to them, listen, um, God has fulfilled the law. Then they say, hallelujah, bless God. You know? Then tomorrow they're in five steps to this and ten steps to that. You say to them, but how are you now in the five steps and ten steps? God has fulfilled the law. They say, yes, we, 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 I know God's fulfilled the law. I believe with all my heart. But they can't apply it in every area of life because they're not wise in that, in that knowledge. They don't have the spirit of wisdom. They've got wisdom here. But not, and another word for, for spirit is an attitude. They don't have an attitude of wisdom where they can apply the wisdom which is Christ. The Bible says Jesus Christ became the wisdom of God for us. Where they can apply Jesus in every area of life. What does it help? You are saved from God that's not angry with you, but you're stingy. You need salvation from being stingy. Because that is not the abundant life. 
Because it's a biggest frustration when you see somebody poor and the money's in your pocket and it burns you, but you can't give it to that man. Here's the Holy Spirit inside you. you you've got a brand new nature, a new man inside you. Somebody's in need. You've got the ability to do something, but you don't. You go away condemned. You feel bad. And then you quote four scriptures. Well, I'm not condemned. I'm not this. I'm not that. And you're in a spiritual war because you, because you don't allow the fullness of God to manifest in you. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying you don't measure up to the standard. I'm saying allow God to be Himself in you. Let, let me put it in other words. Stop faking who you are. That's not who you are. When somebody uh, with me, before, uh, before I really got a hold of grace, I had a temper problem. And I had to come to the place where I don't fake who I really am. Because I was faking who I am. I was trying to pretend that I'm an angry man. But I'm not. I'm not an angry man. I'm a peaceful man. I'm a man full of patience. That's who I am. And in my discovery of who I really are, am, I found that that changed. By the power of God. Because you stop to pretend being something you're not. Hallelujah. And that's why he says here, let's be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And Paul prays that the spirit of wisdom will be upon us. That we can take this knowledge of Christ and apply it to every area of our lives and see the full salvation of Jesus manifest in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. I tell you, there's no life as peaceful as the life where, as the true life you have. It's a true life of peace. Amen. It says, it says here that we have the spirit of wisdom and knowledge. It says that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, that we might know what is the hope of our calling. I don't want to talk about that. That's a whole message. What is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? So it says, I want you to see what is the riches of the glorious, of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. What did God in Christ inherit in you? The Bible says if the seed dies in the ground, it comes up and it doesn't stay alone, but brings forth fruit after its own kind. So what did God inherit and get in Christ? What is part of our inheritance, which is His inheritance? It is a multiplication of who Jesus is in you. So when He died and He rose, He didn't stay alone as the Son of God. Now there are many sons of God with the same mindset, with the same attitude, with the same character, with the same fruit. That's who you really are. Hallelujah. And we're not going to live this life faking and pretending to be this, you know, well, I sought out things, you know. That's who I am. No, no, no. Stop lying. That's not who you are. And you might say, but I've been taught for 30 years that that's who I am. You've just been deceived for 30 years. That's not who you are. You are as He is. Amen. And it can be applied to every area of our life. You might say, but what does this have to do with spiritual warfare? You'll see now. It says, and what is, now it says, and we want to pray, what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power. So He says, I want you to have knowledge of what is the greatness of His power that works towards all of us that believe. What is that power? That is the power that worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. So He says, I pray, I pray that you may have knowledge of the greatness of God's res resurrection power working in you that's resurrecting you into the newness of life of Christ. I want you to have great understanding of this new life and this resurrection power 
So I'm not saying you must now go and do good works. What I'm saying is have knowledge of the true power what you are resurrected into. Now what are we resurrected into? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are His workmanship or His creation, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. So what are we created into? We know God's not angry with us. We know the law has been fulfilled. We know that we don't have to go through the law to find favor before God. But now that we have found favor, now that we come to God free from the law, we receive His Holy Spirit. When we receive His Holy Spirit, we are now created into what? Into a new man, unto good works, which has been prepared beforehand. Why? That we should walk in them. Isn't that awesome? To know that we don't have to try to do good works, but that we've been saved into it. And what I've seen in my life is when I don't see those things manifest, I say, Lord, I thank you that I can grab a hold of my full salvation. For I'm not going to let Jesus pay the full price or it's like a meal. You know, he pays the full price for the whole meal and puts this meal in front of you and you only eat the slop chips and leave the steak. I mean, no, you eat everything. You eat the whole thing. That's exactly the way, that's how God has saved us. Because if we say, God's not angry with us, thank you God, you're not angry with us, now I can live my own life. You know what it means? It means you put yourself back under the law. Because in the beginning I explained to you that the law is man's, or the, or the greatest sin is man saying, I will do it myself. So even when you know the law has been fulfilled, and you refuse to say that the new life that I have originates out of God, and His Spirit has recreated me unto good works, you are living in half of what God has given you. He saved you from unto something. You are saved from the law and its effects unto the life of the Holy Spirit and its effects. Now I hope you don't think that I'm trying to put the law on you. I'm not. And the reason why I say this is part of spiritual warfare is this. Satan comes to the church and the greatest battle in the church is when they do something wrong. So if you go and you sit in front of your computer and you're busy with your pornography, God's not angry with you, for He's paid for that. But when you stand up there, how do you feel and how does your wife or your husband feel? And if your kids should catch you do that, how would you feel? You will struggle with condemnation, my friend. And that is what the devil wants. He wants you to do that thing, and when you do it, he condemns you. You know, now you go, as a believer in the good news, you say, well, there's no condemnation for me. I'm not going to be condemned by this. God loves me unconditionally. You say that, but for a whole day or two days, you struggle with it in your mind. It's a war constantly. Now he says here, I want you to be strong in spiritual warfare, in the power of his resurrection. In other words, <clears throat> be strong in this new person that you've been created into. Because then the devil cannot come every day and accuse you of 20 things, and now you must confess again and battle in your mind against that thing, so that you know that God loves you. When The, the wonderful thing is, when you do miss it or do something that's not good, we don't fall because we don't find our identity in what we do. So we do then say, thank you my God that I am not what I do, but I am what you've done. Thank you Jesus, and thank you that what you've done influences my do as well. So the origin is you. Thank you my God. Because we sit with people that feel so condemned, 
And let me tell you one of the greatest things one, that, that, that uh, uh, the writer um, John wrote. He said to the church, I've got this against you. Were you rather cold or hot? But now you are lukewarm. Now I said, God, how can cold be better than lukewarm? And this is what God said to me. He spoke about the love of God message. Lukewarm is a mixture between grace and law. Hot is the message of grace. Cold is the message of law. A person who has come to the message of grace, believed upon the message of grace, and it doesn't work for him, the chance that he will, and he goes away. So he comes to church, he believes in this good news gospel, his life doesn't change. He doesn't get victory. He still feels so de defeated. The power that Satan has over that person is so great in, this, in the sense of condemnation. Because he will tell him, you know what? Not even the good news works, so that is not true. So now you've already tasted the good work of God. And you say, it doesn't work for me. It's like buying a, a, a Land Rover. And you don't like the Land Rover. I had a 1962 Series A. I'll never buy that again. <laughs> Not even somebody else's one. Now, th that he says is in a very good condition. What do you think will be the chance that I will buy the very same one again? A zero. In the same way, people come and they invest in the gospel of grace. We only get half the knowledge. We still see defeat in our lives. And then Satan comes and says, this thing doesn't work. And people fall away. And how will they ever be renewed unto this gospel of grace? They will say, oh, I've tried, it doesn't work. That is what the Bible says in Hebrews 10. When it talks about willful sin. It's when people come to a place with a taste of the good news. They say, well, this, it's not for me. What's the chance that he will come back? Very small. Very small. Actually zero. In the same way, in our spiritual war that we are in, Satan wants to get you to, to, to condemnation. And what he does to condemn you is he uses your works. So what can get his voice very quiet, and he can only maybe talk a little bit, and not all day long, is when you realize what you've been raised up into. You've been raised up into this new life. So he cannot come. You know, if you come and realize who you are, you don't go around at house at the house drunk every day and shouting at your wife, kicking your children. So now he can't come and condemn you because he doesn't have something. And the very good, let me tell you, preaching works like this. I'm preaching to you now, okay? Say I pray for somebody here that's sick and they get healed. That healing preaches to you. It does. If I pray for somebody here that doesn't get healed, that miracle that didn't take place also preaches. It's got a voice. It says something. In the same way, good works has got a voice. Bad works has got a voice. We've been saved unto good works. We haven't been saved and now we must do good works. We have been saved including the good works. Into that. That's the new you. Now, when you see that manifest in your life, it's a confirmation of what you believe. Now, you believe you are holy, you believe you are righteous, but you don't see any of those things. That is a contradiction on what you believe and makes your Christian life difficult. So let's arise into the full stature of what we've been saved into. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we've been so abused when it comes to good works, it's so difficult to talk about the wonderful thing God has given us. Because we relate that works with hurt. We, it's like, it's, it's like um, somebody that got raped. And now you must explain to them the beauty of sexual intercourse. They've been raped, man. How do you do that? But the fact that they've been raped doesn't change the fact that love is good. In the same way with good works. We've been so abused when it comes to good works that we are so scared that we cannot even talk about the wonderful thing that God has given the body. 
because of the past hurt. And I want to tell you, let's get over our past hurts. Let's get over our past hurts so that we can have fullness of life. And there was a time when I preached the gospel of grace in connection to the law. I applied it to the law. So I would say, we are not saved by our works. It's true. That, that, that's true. Okay, but now how do we preach the gospel concerning good works now in our lives now? We are empowered unto good works. So, and I realized, yes, we preach about the law and the fulfillment of the law, because I came to a place where I said, God, okay, the law's fulfilled. Okay, I'm righteous before you. Okay, I'm justified by your blood. But what now? What now? All of that. Then I realized, God said to me, now I can live in you. You can now come to the throne of in influence or grace, where I can influence you unto the very life that I have. We are saved into that. You know what's so nice? If you've struggled with things, you can now stop if you want. Because you are free. Amen. You can just stop. <laughs> the Bible says, it's so beautiful. It says, sink into. It says, clothe yourself with Christ. How do we, that word clothe, do you know what it means in the Greek? It means to sink into or clothe. To sink into a garment. Well, the best way to, to understand sink into is if you go, if there's quicksand or mud and you walk onto it, how much effort do you use to sink into it? Nothing. You simply allow it to happen. You can resist sinking into the mud and it's going to take a lot of effort for you not to sink into. And you can jump out. In the same way, when it comes to good works, Let's sink into this. Allow this to happen to you. If you in your heart feel, I want to love this person, allow it to happen. Do it. Don't resist. Do it. Allow it. That's who you are. It's the new you trying to come out and manifest. It's like, you know, I planted watermelons, you know, and then you plant that seed, and you see that, that, that thing coming through the ground. It first cracks the ground. When it cracks the ground, you don't step on the thing. Let it come out. So that you can eat the fruit. Amen. When you feel generosity in your heart, when you come to church and you want to give, when it comes to finances in the church, let it happen. Let it happen. That's the real you. God has paid dearly to have that in your life. Let God be. Let Him be. He's there in you. We've been saved unto these things. That's our salvation. That's who we really are. Go with a confident expectation that when you meet people, where you see Christ, what else does God have to manifest Himself but your emotions and your body and your life? You are God's opportunity, man. Amen. So he's removed every barrier and every definition of distance between you and God so that you can come boldly to this fullness of life. Hallelujah. Let's not settle for second best. We are the most holy people on the earth. I want to declare over you that you are victors in every area of life. You've been created. You know what? God made good works. The Bible says He beforehand prepared good works, like a glove. And then He made a people to fit that glove. He made good works and then He created you for that. So there's nothing more natural for you than loving people. There's nothing more natural to you than being generous. There's nothing more natural to you than laying down your life for somebody else. It's the real you. But we've been so used to and programmed to the old way of selfishness. We've come to the knowledge of grace that God's not angry with us. But let's come to the knowledge of the, the, how the real us manifests. So I feel there's somebody here with cancer. Now I get the feeling. Now what am I going to do? Sit down. 
No ways. You allow that feeling, that emotion to grow in you. And you say, I feel there's somebody here with cancer. And then he says, yes. Okay, and then what then? Now, is that now it? No, no. Now you're going to lay hands on him or speak the word and say, God says you are healed. And then what is in you comes into manifestation. It works the same way with the fruit of God. The same way. You feel in your heart, I love this person. I want to be good to them. You feel in your heart, man, I want to be generous. So, are you now just, well, let that feeling just pass away. No, no, no. That's the way in which God comes into you and manifests in you. It's God. That's why the Bible says, He says, I want you to be obedient in my presence, Paul says in Philippians 2.13, and much more in my absence. He says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that works in you both to will and to do. So what he says is, listen, when I'm gone now, work out your salvation. Now that work out doesn't talk about a, a, a mathematical calculation on what you must do to be saved. That work out means outwardly manifest or show forth your salvation or live your salvation. He says, for with, then he says, with fear and trembling. Now that fear and trembling, we, we, we say, oh, I must be so scared. It means with great respect to God. So he says, live, this, live out the salvation with great respect to God, for it is God that works in you to will. So when you will, if you now give the step, he will make it able to manifest. So he says, listen, when you get these feelings, of doing good and loving and being patient and all those things, have respect for that, for that is God working in you. Honor God working in you. That's what it means. It doesn't mean I'm a puppet now God's... He says, listen, that's not, that's not the context. That's if you only quote the one verse that says, God works in you both to will and to do. But the one just before that says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you. So it says, you work out your salvation, for God works this in you. So God comes and works it in us, and what do we do? We yield. That's why the Bible says, yield your members as servants of righteousness. That's how God works in you. That's how we've been, what we've been saved into. Amen. And if you do it or not, it's got nothing to do with God's feeling over you. It's got nothing to do with your righteousness before God. Amen. It says, it, it says there that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Be proud that we can stand against the wiles. That word wiles is the word lust. Against the lusts of Satan. What was the lust of Satan? It's the same word that's used in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, I think it's 5 or 9, where it says there, I think it's 5, where it says that there's corruption in this world through lust. That word lust is a strong desire. So, the th w what happens is, there will be corruption in your life when you still desire good works. Realize who you are. Because if there's a shortage, what Satan comes, he tempts you with a desire for that good work, so that he can sell you the five steps in how to get that breakthrough, In that way he gets you in the law. And it's the same thing. The Bible says corruption came into this world through desire. It, they brought to, he brought to Adam and Eve the desire to be like God by willpower. And that corrupted their whole life. So let's see the fullness in which God has saved us into so that we cannot be tempted with desire. I, so I, I desire so much to be a loving person. You are a loving person. When you feel that love, yield to that love. When you see that shortcoming come, and Satan comes with his temptation, then you say, I'm not going to find my joy in what I do. I find my joy in what he's done. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to see that manifestation. Even if you see the good thing done, you don't say, oh, well, I'm righteous because I do these things. You say, oh, thank God for the manifestation of the real me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To me, that is such good news. I want to cry because 
We've been saved into such a free life. I want to say another thing on finances. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. Paul spoke about the churches in Macedonia. He says, <clears throat> the churches in Macedonia, they were very, very poor. And for you to now go, and this is what I want to say, if you, for you to now jump and say, well, well, I must now bear good fruit, I must now start to give. And now you start to try and give. Man, you're just back where you come from. We don't want, as grace preachers and shepherds of people from the grace perspective, to see people fall into that old death system. We want to just see the fullness of God in you. That's all. And I want to explain to you what happened in the churches in Macedonia. They were very, very poor. Very poor. And then the church in Corinth decided to take up a collection for the poor churches in Jerusalem. So, here's Corinth rich. Okay? It's like saying the people in Santon or the people in Belito decided to take up an offering for the poor churches in western Zambia or in the, in the, 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 the slums of, of Nairobi. Now I go and I preach in a squatter camp in, um, out here. And I tell them, I said, listen man, let's rejoice. For the church in Belito decided to take up an offering amongst them for the poor churches in Zambia. Let's rejoice. Now the poor church in the squatter camp says, we also want to give. That's what happened in 2 Corinthians. Go and read it. We also want to contribute to them. Then Paul said, no, <laughs> you are poor. Then the Bible says, these guys, the grace, then Paul says, I want to testify to you churches in Corinth, because the church in Corinth never gave. So Paul said, listen man, these people started it, the churches in Macedonia are giving towards this course, and now some of these churches in Macedonia said, I'm going to go with you, Paul, when we collect this thing in, in Corinth, and then we're going to take it to these poor churches. Now Paul's worried. Because these people promised, it's a year now, they haven't fulfilled their promise, and the poor people were inspired by what they did to give, and now how's it going to look if they don't give, and they're so rich? So he says, I want to write to you in Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. And I want to testify about the grace of God that was upon the churches in Macedonia. How that this grace abounded even in their deep poverty unto the riches of their liberty. And they gave to the point that we said, we can't take any more. So it says, I want to testify of the grace of God that came upon the churches in Macedonia, how they, how this grace abounded towards their liberty. So they were set free to what? To give. They were liberated not to be manipulated and give under manipulation to the place of giving as the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he used that, and he spoke to the church in, in, in Corinth, and he said, you churches in Corinth, you know the grace of God, that he was rich and became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. But now I'm telling you that I want you to abound in this grace, which was in the churches as well. And the word grace means influence. So God influences us unto who he is. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to just say to you, you've been set free to be the person you've always wanted to be today. By Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your unconditional love. I want to thank you that you care for us in such a great way. Thank you that Aunt has invited me here. I thank you, Lord, for the love they have for their community. Thank you, Lord, for the outreach we could have had. Thank you for your unconditional love. There's no conditions to your love, for every condition has been met, and we stand in your love. 
Thank you that your love includes the very nature of God living in us. Therefore, we live a life of, as part of our war, is this good life manifesting in us. We are strong in you, Lord, and in the power of your resurrection. We've been resurrected into your newness of life. Thank you for that, my God. Thank you that upon this is no condemnation, only the freedom and the liberty to be who you've made us to be. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want every person that is sick in this place just to raise your hand. If you've got any sickness, raise your hand. I'm not going to lay hands on you individually. But just put your hand where your sickness is and I'm going to pray for you. And I believe you will be healed. Amen. You're going to be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. There's a woman here. You've got a problem with your breasts. I don't know if there's pain or, or, or lumps or whatever. You're being healed by the power of God right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody here. There's a deter your, 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 the bone in your shoulders is deteriorating. And um, the doctor said it's operations and this and that. And they don't even think it's going to be successful. God says, I heal you right now. In Jesus' mighty name. By the power, power, power of God. Hallelujah. There's, there's a woman here. You struggle with, uh, um, with, with your menstruation. doesn't want to stop. It just continues. You're just bleeding. It stops right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. By the power of God, I bring you healing. I bring you healing in Jesus' name. Father, every person, whatever sickness he has, as he lays his hand, by the fire of God, that sickness is consumed right now. I declare you healed of all pain, healed of all cancer, healed of all blindness, deafness, sickness, whatever arthritis, osteoporosis, depression. I declare you healed by the power of God. I thank you, Lord, as you go through people individually here and you heal them all. I declare you are healed in Jesus' name. Amen.